And I'm going to try to do his presentation justice. I'm I'm ready. I'm on. So if they're ready, we're ready. That's just a little bit of a preview of uh, what we're going to be getting into. Um, I don't really like to talk about myself, but I figured I'd give you guys just a little bit of background and kind of read through. I'm a photographer, graduated from the University of Houston, a graphic designer, videographer, personal interest, love aviation, love the travel, and definitely a foodie. 13 4. The best key lime pie in the country, and I heard Florida's got some of the best, so another reason for me to come down. Uh, presently, I am the owner of Sector K Media. It's my own company. I'm the editor of uh, Airspeed Magazine, and that is through International Society for Aviation and Photography. It's another nonprofit organization uh, where we have photographers from all over the world joining, it's just like you guys. And uh, we put out an online magazine. Um, I'm a photographer for Tora Tora Tora. And I also do commemorative Air Force uh, contract photographer for them. I uh, do a lot with the Warbirds and some official photography. Uh, I'm the official photographer for air shows around the country. And I've worked for a lot of uh, marketing companies and graphic designers. And for I do some work for defense sponsors. And last, I don't do wedding photography. <laughs> I like you guys if you do it. I don't like the bridezillas or photographing Uncle Henry in the background while the bride and groom are saying the vows. So that's uh, a good, good trade if you guys can take care of it and do your job as a wedding photographer. But what if they got married in the air? That may be different. <laughs> I'm doing that one time. So, but uh, speaking of wedding, uh, if you've ever gone to a wedding or a party and someone asks you, what do you do for them? Okay. I had to think about that because, number one, I'm a photographer. I love shooting and trying to get the best images, but I'm a graphic designer, meaning I may have to destroy some really good images to come up with a marketing plan for a company or any kind of advertising on billboards and things like that. And then I do some video. So what did I come up with? storytelling. Now, photography, video, and everything in between has become a little bit different because when we're children, we learn stories or we hear the stories from teachers, parents, and everybody else. But as we grow up, we can share our experience and tell our own stories or hear other people's stories and push it out there through our photography. Okay? So with social media, you ever hear the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words? 
Well, now we can go way beyond that in today's world. And so uh, some of the things I'll be talking about today is, of course, uh, shooting air-to-air -air photography, uh, giving you guys some hints on tips on how to shoot air shows, and you guys may be able to teach me some things that I don't know as well. It's always open. And also I'm going to um, share some conventions on how to get your story published and maybe shoot for a cover. That's an ultimate goal that a lot of people aspire to is how do you get your photo into a magazine and on the cover, okay? And so after that, I'm gonna take you guys back in time where I'm gonna visit uh, Normandy and 70 years later for the three day anniversary, okay? And also uh, teach you guys a little bit about design work and creating your own coffee table books or any type of work like that. So we're getting started with shooting air to air, the experience. So a lot of people have an office in the building where my office is in the sky at 5,000 feet. Uh, people look at commercials, like airline commercials, you see the airplanes flying in the sky, but they question, how do you get that photo? Or how do you get the video? And so one of the things we do is, how do you do the area air experience? Well, it starts off with the mission or goal. Before you even take off and do anything, you want to start off with the mission. What is your mission and what do you want to accomplish? Well, for a pilot, they always want to make themselves look good for their I love you guys, right? That's one of the things. But the other thing is, it could be a pilot in the plane you want to talk about. It could be a warbird and a veteran that used to fly that particular airplane. Or it could be a sponsor that wants to put their logo on the airplane and the air show performer says, hey, I have to show how the, how the sponsor can be showcased on my airplane. And that happens a lot, actually, quite frequently behind the scenes for an air show. So one of the things that we'll go through is what type of lighting do you want for a particular photo shoot? And let's go through some opportunities of what it is. So before you even fly, you want to consider a couple of things. You have to have a photo pilot. You want to make sure a photo pilot is formation qualified at least and knows something about air-to-air -air photography. Now, a lot of opportunities of photographers would love to do an air-to-air -air experience, but one key thing to remember is safety. You always want to know who the pilot is you're flying with. If they have none of those things that I just mentioned to you, you may want to reconsider flying because it is all about safety and think about your own life. Over the years, I've had a lot of friends pass away and die because they made the mistake of not flying with an experienced pilot. And they've had issues and emergencies. And so the last thing we want is for anyone to get hurt. So that is one key aspect. So there are different things we can do. You can have an aerobatic pilot, and you guys may know him. This is Sean Tucker right here. Could do a warbird, the Spitfire at sunset, just warm peach flying this one. Or two, this is the Cobra right here, P 63 and P 39 Air Cobra. And this one was for a theme of the Battle of the Cobras. So this was a shoot for that. And this one is actually really, really rare uh, to have three mates. Actually, this was done over Texas and felt a little weird about this because it's on 4th of July. So you're flying much to make it 4th of July. It's a little awkward. But this is one of the times where we had to do this at close to high noon. So the lighting wasn't perfect, but hey, take what you can get in a rare opportunity like this. Uh, this is actually even more rare. Um, this is with a B-17, a B-52 in the back and a B-1 there. Uh, the Air Force had a really hard time with this one, but what was missing was the B-2 and the B-25 had maintenance issues and had weather. So that was going to be the trifecta with having all these bombers in the air together doing a very air shoot. Uh, this is also what you call the symbol of formation. We fly the Warbirds, radial engine airplanes with the jets. It's like the heritage flight and legacy flight you guys may have seen in air shows, right? The Air Force flies the F-16 with the Mustang or a legacy flight F-18 Hornet flies with a uh, 228 or a Corsair. This is another one. Um, A-26 is one of the airplanes I'm flying with commemorative the Air Force and flying with the D-1. This is actually a bomber legacy flight we put together 
I talked to the Air Force and it took a little while to bend their ear, but I got to the right people for the Air Force to make this happen. These are the two bombers, the fastest of their time. The A-26 is a very fast airplane during World War II, and the B-1 bomber is currently the fastest bomber we have in the MVP. This right here is a five ship that we did. Uh, 2019 commemorative Air Force home show that we had, uh, the theme was Navy. And so we had these five airplanes, the one, the two that are missing are the SBD Helldiver and the TBM Avenger. Um, unfortunately, they had maintenance issues as well. So we had to deal with the five. And this one's kind of interesting. The guy doesn't have a big head. It's just the world's smallest jet. <laughs> you guys remember Octopussy, this is a BB-5 where the guy was, he, Roger Moore flew the airplane through a hangar in that movie, and this is the same type of airplane right here. Is that a BB-5 or a BB-5J? BB-5J. Thanks. It's a jet one. Yeah. Okay. So this particular deal goes back to what I was telling you about. Um, the sponsor was actually the logos right on the wing. So when Justin approached me, he brought this airplane back into the airship circuit and he said, hey, can you photograph the airplane with the logos? He said, sure. Unfortunately, I was flying in a little World War II biplane versus this pen in a jet. So how am I going to do this? Separate speeds, I'm slow, he's fast. Well, put it in burst mode and hope for the best when he zips by. He had to do his performance. He had about five minutes worth of fuel left to get back to the airport after flying over the lake. And they said, you know what? Put it in a knife edge and zip by me, and I'll see if I can get it. So this is what I caught right here. And so this was at towards sunset after we finished the show. And this is for advertising. This is for advertising. Okay. So interesting. Use the shot on the advertising uh, on postcards for USF fleet tracking. And so they had handed out the postcards wherever he went. And so this really helps out for advertising and marketing. And so there are sponsors out there who do avionics and things like that. And you'll see them all plastered over the airplanes like Sean Tucker. So this goes to into the briefing. Before we take off to fly, we have to do a briefing. And this means that everybody involved that are the pilots, the safety pilot flying you, any safety observers that you have that want to witness the formation flight to make sure we're all safe, that's what we're going to do. We have to have a plan and figure out making sure all the pilots and parties are in the same agreement with the shooting list that I'm going to show you guys next. So you may hear some things like if you see something, say something. Or if you hear, call a knock it off. That means an emergency. Okay. And Bad news doesn't get better over time. There's a problem with your plan. You say something as quick as possible so we can sort it out. Business, serious, I mean, flying is serious business here, but we just don't want anybody scratching the game with other airplanes. So, what happens in a brief? So, we talk about a student list showing different formations of profiles. Flight plan, we talk about the attitude and altitude we want to fly, and where do we want to go? There are mountains in California. We want to use that as a backdrop, figure out how to get there and how much time it's going to take. Weather, dealing with winds and clouds, we want puffy clouds, or if there's a storm approaching, we have to figure out our time to fly and how much time we need to get back home. Uh, establish who is flying and what order. Uh, in the five ship that I showed you guys, we had multiple formations. After the five, we had to do one with all three cats, and then a separate one with the Dolphins. And I'll go through that. And then same thing with the knock it off I mentioned to you guys, that's the emergency. Anybody flying can call that. If they see something, smoke coming out of the airplane, for whatever reason, we have to get the airplanes down on the ground safely. That is absolute key. Doesn't matter if the shoot goes bad and we gotta kill it. I'm, I would rather kill a shoot rather than kill anybody on the ground or in the air. Pilot question. Are the pilots formation qualified? As I said, it's very important if you have a formation qualified pilot. A lot of times pilots want to fly their own airplane. However, if they've never flown the formation, you may want to have a formation pilot fly with them so they can get the shot and they can actually do a formation properly. And so 
we can have everybody not fly slow. Uh, airspeed, what are they comfortable flying? The reason why I say airspeed is because if we're flying in the similar air, uh, formation with the radial engine fighter, and you're actually flying with a uh, modern jet, like an inherited flight, those are airspeed. And same thing with the fighter flying with the bomber. There are different airspeed and different ways the, the plans were formed. So you want to make sure everyone is good with their airspeeds when making the transition. Any issues on the shooting list? I'll go through the shooting list with you guys next on the list. That way we can go every go through everything and make sure everyone has clarity on each formation and what that you want to accomplish. Ask the pilots that are local for flying at an air show. You don't know the area real well, but you know other pilots do. Talk to them, find out where there's little air traffic to go do the shoot. Um, you want to make sure that there's the least amount of airspace with other airplanes and sharing the skies to make sure we don't crash into anyone else. Last but not least, are you okay to fly? A lot of times we do the shoots at the end of the day, so we'll be going throughout the whole air show, and then afterwards we'll go do the shoot. You want to make sure everybody's hydrated, everybody's confident to fly. If they don't feel well, don't do it. That's just the way it works. Same thing in the air show industry. When we're at an air show, don't do anything dumb. You want to make sure everybody has the right mindset, and it's okay. If you screw up, you screw up in the act. Nobody knows. The audience loves to watch the airplanes fly. They don't know the difference, right? Same thing when you're doing this. You want to make sure all the pilots are healthy enough and feel good to fly. Shooting list. So this is an example of a shooting list I did with a B-17, a C-45, and an S&J, or as other people know it as a T-6. This is a formation with of all the different positions that I wanted these guys to fly. You'll see a little circle for photo, that's the photo shift of me, B-17, S and J, and C-45. So these are different names of the positions that I wanted the airplanes to fly. I highlighted the number four is a VIG formation, and this is what it actually looks like. That's your VIG, or B. B-17 is on the front, and the other two airplanes are on the side like that. And this is actually kind of interesting because this is actually in Galveston, Texas, right next to the Gulf of Mexico, where it's flat. And that right there looks like that one. That's actually smoke from a wildfire. I thought that was really neat because you look like they're mountains. So there's kind of a blessing in the skies that the fire blew all that smoke out there. So it created a nice landscape for me. And the sun, I had to face the planes in to get some direct sunlight on the airplanes to highlight the clouds. This is a, another shooting plan. This is for the five ship that I was showing you guys earlier. Sorry for the bad lighting, the real precaution was horrible, but wanted to get this to show you guys what it was like for a larger formation. Um, I collaborated with Scott Slocum. You guys know who Scott Slocum is, the wonderful air to air photographer. He shoots uh, and does workshops teaching air to air photography. If you go to air to air ventures, adventures.com, you can learn a lot more and he, you can. Pay him to take some of his classes. He does a fantastic job and does a lot all over the country. Um, as you can see, there are tons of formations that we came up with here, starting you know one all the way to seven. And you can see the how we broke off into the three ships in five. And number four, I'm going to take that as an example. So this is one of the shots we came up with. This is what you call a stack up echelon formation. So you have the SPD Dauntless, then you have the SM2 Wildcat, the SXF Hellcat, the Bearcat, and then at the top is the Corsair. All of these airplanes belong to the Commemorative Air Force, and you have to have really good pilots to do formations like this. And fortunately, we have good pilots and the airplanes to do it with. So this is one of the things that we do uh, in I've been fortunate enough to do a lot of these warbirds uh, for the Commemorative Air Force. And so we have to have really, really good communication and make sure there are no minimal needs. What are you typically in, or does it just vary from place to place or shoot to shoot? To place. It depends on what I can fly in. Uh, sometimes it could be a bonanza, 
or a baron. You take the side door off uh, and just wear a harness, or it could be a T6. I'm in the back seat. Uh, preferably, I, I like the Baron or A36 Bonanza, but again, it's whatever you can get their hands on. I prefer not to shoot behind glass, and we'll talk about that in a few more minutes, and I'll show you guys uh, what I mean. So communication, um, radio and hand signal. So when I'm on board, I have a headset, and basically I can communicate with my photo pilot on what I want these guys that I'm photographing to do. The other thing is, if I can have direct contact with them, which is possible, I can talk to them and tell them where to move and where I want them in position. And it's kind of hard because they have to trust me. They can't see what I'm looking at through my camera, so it's up to me to direct them where I want them to be. And so I'll show you guys next here. So this is me in the T6 right here. As you can see, the canopy forward. I'm not shooting behind any glass. And for this particular shot, the sun is right at me. What you want is to always have the sun on the airplane. So unfortunately, sometimes the pilots are looking at me and the sun's in their eyes. So I have to be very careful to make the adjustments to where they can see me and I can see them. And it's kind of hard to do because if they lose sight of you, that's very dangerous because they could easily collide into you. So what you want to do is make sure that everyone has line of sight of each other at all times. So transmitting through the radio is one, and uh, here's another version right here, where you can see a little bit from a different angle. So the top right there, this is the bearing, you can see the, the videographer and the photographer looking out. That's Sean Tucker right there, and then this is Jesse right here. I'm in the B-17 looking at them. I'm a load master on the bomber, so I have to do certain things because I have to fire with the Mayan. So this is one photo where I had looking back, and then this is what it looks like from the photo shoot. This is what they got. So that's me and the B-17 back there speaking this way. So that way you can see the angle from both directions right here. So we also do hand signals as well. And this was actually pretty rare. It makes me sad even because this is a Spitfire. If you get an opportunity to see warbirds, shoot as much of them as you can because you never know when something's going to happen to one or when we're not going to be able to fly anymore. We're fortunate enough right now because we have the resources to rebuild engines and keep the airplanes flying, but we may not have that opportunity in about 10 years. Uh, what's going to kill the Warbird community is its insurance, too. There are a lot of accidents that happen when premiums keep going up, so that may change. So, considering how close these guys are, he can see me and I can see him very closely. He could be within five or six feet of me. And sometimes with the aromatic guys, it's like literally you can pick the wing outside the door. So we don't want them to get that close, but you know, it usually depends on what's going on. Here, this is Warren Beach. We're flying over the Gulf of Mexico. Surprisingly, this was a good day. You guys have good clean water. We've got muddy water in our Gulf, so it's horrible. But in this instance, it was really good. Same thing here. Uh, this was uh, from the other shoot. Uh, that I was showing you guys with three ship. And this was a little bit better after we cleared out from the smoke. I was able to get all three lined up here. Again, you want to be where everybody can see you, see you, and you can see them. So we get to timing. We've talked about a mission, talked about a briefing, and how we communicate. Now it comes to racing forward and holding out. So we talked about our briefing and we then we get to what is it that we have to do? We have to go fly. So I try and find my shoots at sunset or you can do at sunrise. I don't like to do sunrise because I'm a lazy person. I like to wake up late. But, and so the maintainers as well. They don't want to wake up that early. The pilot's more alert. Uh, in, at sunset. So I try and shoot the golden hour. And so usually it's about an hour, but most of the time the range I want to shoot for is anywhere between 15 and 30 minutes. Again, as soon as you crank the engine on, you're burning money. So the more you can plan and get everything set up, the more clarity you can get on the mission, the faster you can get up in the air and get back down. 
This is actually a 2017 I shot from C-47, where they do a conical heritage flight. And this is right after a storm came through. So I had a little bit of beam of light coming through, uh, which is really nice. I was able to get, and it's pretty intimidating because C-17 is a gigantic airplane, right? So you see the wing that really close, but how do you get the entire airplane? So uh, taking a few different lenses help. Uh, I usually carry a 24 to 105. That's kind of my go-to lens. You can have a 70 to 200. I don't like shooting with a 16 to 35 because it's just too much distortion uh, in doing that. Again, this is another uh, five ship. Um, this is where I want to talk a little about, about shutter speed. Shutter speed right here is 60 of a second. You get the nice pop disc with what you're shooting for uh, with the sun on. And what I normally do is for an air to air shoot and even shooting air shoot with the high right? Everybody loves to get a pop blur of a P51 or a Warbird flying. Well, what I normally do is I start high with my shutter speed, go about five hundredths of a second, and then I work my way down. That way you have a consistent build of sharp shot because the slower the shutter speed the more blurriness you're going to get unless you're very very stable especially when you're flying in the air every little movement you make little wind turbulence things like that all the airplanes are going to move be moving around just a little bit and it doesn't take much when you're using when you're shooting at 60 of a second to see just a little bit off uh, this is one out of probably 20 shots and again Get the SD cards and CF Express cards or whatever cards you're using. Make sure they have a fast write and read speed for the buffering that's going on in your cameras. Okay. This is uh, one of the seaplanes I shot. Connie Edwards, this is a private owner over the water. And one of the things about this is if you've never been on a seaplane, they have an air horn, a huge, a loud horn. So it warns the boats to get out of the way. So it's actually pretty funny to hear that noise and all these boats just get out of the way so you land on the water. But if you're going to do something like this or if you're getting a landing shot of an airplane at an airport, make sure the tower knows what you're doing. And so that way they understand where the planes are going to be at and where to accommodate everybody to clear the airspace for you. Again, um, some of the best lighting is at sunset. And it's in the fall. The colors really change dramatically, believe it or not, in the fall. And you can see there's a lot more colors. And this is, I didn't do a lot of Photoshop work to this at all. So this is pretty much the pinks, the blues, everything like that just really stands out in the fall. The colors is a lot more colder air. So there's a lot more Christmas to it. Um, same thing with this one. This is actually this wow. storm was actually for the use of us. And so we're flying home from a trip, and I noticed the sun rays are beaming straight through the clouds like that. So I was like, that's a gorgeous photo right there. I need to shoot that. That's amazing. Wow. And this one, same thing. Playing with the light, whether you're, the sun is on the airplanes or not, you always want to play with the, the sunlight and try and capture different views. This was actually interesting because I never knew how much there was a blue flame coming out of the exhaust by the engine power there. Mm -hmm. wow. So the darker the, the the more the sun went down, the brighter the flame was coming out. And I thought that was really cool. So I shoot to the very, very last inch of light. Meaning this was about I had about five more minutes where I'm being final and then put the airplane down. Uh, depending on the classification of your airplane, if it's a limited category of aircraft or unlimited or whatever, uh, a lot of warbirds can't fly after coming. So our goal is to always land before the sun sets. So we get the mission accomplished. Once you get those photos, you want, I try and enjoy every bit of sun, sunlight that I can and get every different angle that I can, because again, shoot it all up. It's all digital. You know, if you're using film, some people are used film. You have to be uh, a lot more careful of what you want to shoot at, but enjoy the golden hour. 
So the, the vapor right here is kind of interesting. And this is why I shot this one to show you guys. One of the things that I look at when we're doing air show photography is everybody loves to shoot like the crossing shots with the blues. Everybody likes to do all these different things. But what do they do? Shoot the photo, look down at their camera to see what they got. Well, when you do that, the plane was still flying. You missed some phenomenal vapor. You see a lot of things happen. And I look back at the guys and say, hey, did you see that? They go, no. They're looking at the camera and say, guess what? I'll sell you my photo. <laughs> but anyway, again, vapor can happen really quick with the subject. And this is on the uh, air air shoot with the C-17. And so, like I said, don't look at your photos while an act is flying. Wait till there's dead space in between the act to take a look at your photos. And realistically, you don't want to delete your photos until you get home because everything looks great in the camera. But when you get it on the computer at home, it could be, could be a completely different story. And you're going frame by frame. So my suggestion is go home and look at your photos and delete whatever garbage you don't want there because you never know what you want. Yes, sir. So what, if, if, you're, if you do that, right, and... You know, sometimes it's almost necessary to look down and look at it and see what you did get. Maybe the uh, stop is a little, if you, if you crank it up a little more, it's going to, you know, take it. Right. It's going to sharpen it up more. Right. The ISO's a little too high, or, you know. So you can do that. And, and then here, you're going to miss a shot. So, right. And here's something else. I'm glad you mentioned that because here's something I also want to talk to you guys about. And you guys may do it or may not do it. You may agree with me or not, and may disagree with me. But I shoot shutter priority. And for ISO, I leave it on automatic. And the reason being is because weather, when clouds block the sun, everything changes. But if they're performing, all of a sudden the cloud moves, you have boom, bright sunlight, right? So if you leave your ISO and auto during the day, this is just for the day, what I'm talking about. Shooting air shows, that's one less thing to worry about, okay? Same thing with your F-stop. Sometimes those moments, those are less things you have to worry about because air shows are going on so quickly, you just want to get the shots and not worry about it as much. If you want to shoot and vary your shots like that, shooting with your F, experimenting with your different F-stops, even during bright sun, put a neutral density filter on there to cut some of that light out. You can do that as well. But like I said, just keep in mind that there are possibilities where you keep it at auto ISO, you'll be fine on most of the shots. What do you think? I use shutter priority. That's what I, and again, everybody has different ways of method for shots. So. Uh, I use R6, mirrorless, and I also use 7D Mark II. So we'll get into questions afterwards because okay, that's sorry. another thing you want. No, that's okay. I'm, I'm gonna have to leave. Oh no, no, that's that's fine. And I appreciate you asking the questions. But uh, the cameras, same thing with um, shooting mirrorless cameras, and we'll get into that afterwards. Uh, but yeah, it, I know you have to leave. So questions like that, I don't mind asking if uh, you asking the question and answering. Um, I'm gonna just enjoy it. Yeah. Well, no, I heard this. So I'm just like, how does he do yeah. that? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Yeah, ask you, there's no dumb questions. Ask me a question, period. That's exactly I just what got I back into the photography and finally bought an EOS sound, just a basic right. 2012 model EOS sound got it for like 200 bucks. And I bought a better lens and now I'm starting to go back into photography after 20 years. Yeah, and we will, so. yeah, and we'll get into uh, shooting mirrorless because it's very, it's, there's a big learning curve going from the uh, yeah. mirrorless, right? <laughs> There's a lot. I had Canon loan me a bunch of cameras and we'll get into that, but I can also talk to you and give you my card as well. That's when you my instruction yeah. manual in Japanese. Okay. There's a lot to it. <laughs> I was going to make a comment that also, if you're looking at your pictures that you've taken, you're using up your battery. And you could possibly use up too much of your battery. And the good shot at the end of the finale, you miss because the battery is in. Right. Well, and that's the other thing you want to invest in a good battery for two or two batteries. What about like a small rig, like a rig, you know, a cage? Yeah. You know, with, a, with a bigger battery. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Battery grip having two batteries helps out a lot. Oh, yeah. It's like the whole thing. Uh, however, it depends on if you're shooting a lot of video. 
you're shooting 4K video, it's going to suck and dry. So you always want to have some spare battery. Um, here's another one with the covers right there, different angles. This is another one right here. Um, so what's really phenomenal was difference in airspeed, right? I was on the C-130 in the ramp, and we're driving the B-17. Well, the B-1 and B-62 are flying so fast, the only way to catch them was to do have them do race track havoc run. So they kept coming around, but it catch this particular moment when they're going by, so it looks like we're going to uh, stack down that one formation. So this was a kind of a hard shot to get, and this wasn't, uh, I'm not trying to sound conceited, but I didn't Photoshop this one. It just happened to be luck that I caught that shot. This is out of a tail of a B-25. Uh, we took out the gun barrel, and I was able to sit back and look at the airplanes and fly. So this is over Lake Palestine. Uh, Randy Ball, Mike Temper, and Bill Culbertson were the other the three pilots here in flying the maze. Same thing with the B-17 and B-25. This was the B-25 by shooting on the devil dog. Uh, this is the position right here where we took out the gun barrel so I could sit back there and just face backwards the entire time. It's kind of weird facing backwards while you're taking off and flying around because the whole world is different instead of looking at it only one direction. It's the opposite direction. So first time I did it, I thought it was going to be but yeah. <laughs> not bad. Uh, this is part of the three ship. This is the FMC Wildcat, the Hellcat, Hell and then the Bearcat on the end. So this is basically the three cats. Uh, this is for uh, the drone. -in. And this is another view right here. And again, this is where we talk about anything and everything you fly. You know, when you're flying and doing the shoot, you just want to capture everything because you don't know what's going to come out. So my goal was to try and get the glistening sunlight off the bottom of the airplane because I was also shooting video. And so whatever you do, again, shoot it up. Shoot as many shots as you can get, and go back through and see what you got. And, you know, again, slow stutter speed, this is what I was talking about. If the sun's not on, but you can still see it. Again, you don't want to slow it down because during an air show, you want some prop blur where you're not freezing the prop, but you don't want it to the point where you're trying to do the same thing to catch a prop blur because your probability is going to have some blurry photos because they're flying so fast. And if you're, if you like the challenge, you can try and do it. And I have been able to do it a couple times because it's very, very rare. This is the uh, SPD Dauntless. Um, so surprisingly, when we did this in 2019, the movie, the remake of Midway, actually came out. So it was kind of neat to take a picture of the SPD Dauntless because this. This dive bomber was actually the most effective, uh, one of the most effective bombers in the Battle of Midway during World War II. And this is actually Paul Hillard. He was a Marine Corps veteran that flew in the backseat of SPD Dauntless dive bombers. He wasn't at Midway, but he flew bombing missions in the Philippines during World War II. And he is one of the reasons why, like many veterans, I like to turn into a storyteller because. It's a mission that I like is to tell people about veterans and what they did in World War II. The bigger picture, pilots and planes. A lot of people love to shoot airplanes like we all do, aviation photography, but the bigger picture is, it's not just pilots, it's not just the airplane, but it's also the pilots and the culture. So when you're out there at the air shows, shooting photos of all these airplanes, I saw some nice shots of the, the Photographers being shot, looking up and getting all the photos of planes flying. That's a really unique, great shot. I don't know who did that, but I applaud whoever did it. Um, so I did a story and I wanted to figure out what to do uh, to convey the story to the news station. Okay. So I had a couple things in mind. I wanted to do goal. My first goal was to get some exposure for the air show, uh, the Wings of the Houston Air Show. All the money there is raised for the Commanders of the Air Force supporting the organization to keep the World War flying, same thing supporting the veterans, so forth and so on. Two, uh, I wanted to show people how passionate I am about aviation, but also show how passionate the pilots are to fly the air show and also talk a little bit about the culture. And three, 
I just wanted to hype it all up to people who've never flown before and are fascinated by flying. And I know I'm meeting some of you guys. Everybody loves the Blue Angels and loves air shows. So this kind of fits right into here because unfortunately I can't be here next weekend for the home show of the Blues, but I know a lot of you guys will probably be out there. So I pitched the story to the, the TV station and the news station thought it'd be a great idea. Uh, the station manager talked to me, he's like, I've never done this. I want to do this. What are we going to do? So I told him what we're going to do. He goes, are you sure we're going to do this? I mean, yes, we're going to do it. So the picture is got in. So we had to work on the camera angles for the news station to figure out what we wanted to capture. Then I had to talk to Sean and the pilot, or the photo pilot, on what kind of angles to shoot. So this is what we're going to do. How would a preview itself? How would a preview itself? How would a preview itself? How would a preview I'm one of the ones that you go up and you get in a get in a next to the So that was a short uh, news segment. And what's kind of funny is I didn't tell my parents about this. My parents were with me throughout the case for a while. So my relatives called them, they saw the news story. And so, well, it's, and I told them it's going to air again tonight. And I, I can sit there with you guys watch. So I'm sitting there with my parents. And after the story ran, my mom turns off the TV and looks at me. And she's like, This is what you do for a living? And I go, Well, yeah. You said you're a photographer. And I said, Well, yeah, aviation photographer. And she's like, There's no door, there's no window. On the airplane. I said, well, yeah, but I'm strapped in with a harness. And she looked at me and she goes, don't ever tell me what you're doing. <laughs> so worth the warning for all the parents out there and the grandchildren that you have. You never know what they're going to come back to tell you in the profession. But if they do become an aviation photographer, now you've got some warning of what you're doing. I told my friend, he does crazy stuff. All I can say is never let your future class. <laughs> we'll get into that too. And I can tell you that insurance companies do not like what I do. But, um, so, this is another photo I got from the shoot. Uh, I was looking down on him. And again, 60 of a second, got very lucky right there that everything was sharp in perspective. I thought this photo was pretty interesting. Um, the guy writing down below, you can see the silhouette or the shadow of him doing snap holes. And I thought that was really cool. Again, Nasty Gulf water. You guys have the good water. So. 
horrible. Nothing Photoshop could fix that problem. It was so nasty. <laughs> I thought this was fairly interesting. Frame by frame, I decided to take each frame and look at what he did in that tumble in the next um, video. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is this fourth frame right here, you can see how much he flipped it from that perspective to there. And so it, again, it could be the, the car buffering not riding fast enough or, you know, but just to show you how quickly he does that tumble. And there we go. The glamour shot, the beauty shot, the <laughs> I love me not wall shot. You know, I love me wall shot right there. Always make sure you get a good close up of the pilot and a good thumbs up. This was actually funny. Uh, this is on the bottom of the photo airplane that I was flying on. If you're not Sean Tucker and you can read this, you're too close. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty hilarious. So, so next. We get to design your story, chase the cover. Now that we've done the photo shoot, you guys have a little bit of knowledge on what it's like to do a TV story. Um, and now I'm gonna get into a little bit of how to craft your story, how to build a magazine story, um, and how to kind of sell it. And I'm gonna give you guys a few tips. I'm not guaranteeing you're gonna get your story into a magazine or get a cover, but hopefully it'll give you a few tips on how you can Try and get yourself published in a magazine. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am a graphic designer. So my brain is wired a little bit differently. So the photos I take, I'm kind of thinking along the lines of what I could do in the future. Because an airship performer, I don't really take the photos, but sometimes I have to do the advertising for them. So I have to look at different angles and the way the videos and everything else are shot. Um, I thought about doing some work that I did with Atlas Air. Uh, they fly the 747 cargo around the world. If you're not the camera, this is Pensacola. You guys are home with the Blue Angels, so let's do something with the Blue Angels. So this is actually a story I did a while back. And for those of you guys who know the blues, you remember Fat Albert and the Jato takeoff, right? Rocket. So 2009, that was the last year they did this. And so they came to Houston right before Pensacola was the last home show, and that was the end of it. That was all they were going to do. No more after that. So I sat back and thought about it. I was like, yeah, it's going to be a really cool photograph, but it'd be even better if I could get a ride on the airplane than the Jada. So I scoured every aviation photography magazine that I could, talk to the, all the editors and see if any would advice so I can get a seat on it. They only offer a certain number of seats for media, and the rest is local military for the rest of the seats, right? And so the cockpit, normally they have the two seats reserved for pilots, and the rest are for everybody else. So this is a great photo of all the people that went up with me. And so it was quite an experience because, you know, it's a rare opportunity to be able to do this. So one of the things that my friend with National Geographic told me was, it's not what you do, it's the story you tell. So with all the photographs that I took, and I took a lot of everything, how do you build the story? What do you tell when you're doing the story? So I'm gonna walk you guys through a little bit of what it took for me to what I did. And so there are a lot of odds and ends, so I try to cut to the chase uh, and try and do as much as I could um, in the short amount of time we have. So walking around the airplane, I was able to get a really good look at the Jada bottles. Uh, and here's some really great stories from the other blues. We're talking about the history of Fat Albert Airlines. Um, you can see some close-ups of the rockets right here. And so these rockets have been stored since Vietnam. They've been using them everywhere. And then over time, they weren't going to be used anymore because some of them were lost in the hurricanes in Florida. And then other times, it was just getting costly, and they decided, you know what, let's not do this anymore. Now that you guys have a UC, now that they have a new C-130, times have changed. Um, these are two pilots that we're going to sit in the front of the cockpit. Excuse me. And this is another uh, guy with the newspaper. And one thing I like to do is shoot people that don't know a lot about aviation. I love to watch children get inspired about flying. And I've met some kids when they're really little, and now they're flying fighters for the Air Force and the Navy. 
So this blank screen you're gonna see here, this is actually a photo from the back side of Bad Albert. And one of the reasons why I did this is because I want to show you guys. When you're building a magazine story or article, a lot of times I shoot photography in a way that I'm going to put text on the photo or if the graphic designer is looking at a magazine and the editors are looking at photos, what do you do and how do you build it? Okay. A lot of times magazines are going to keep things simple. They're going to have columns of text on each side and things like that. Well, what I what graphic designers call negative space, you guys may have heard the term negative space. If there's a blank space on a photograph where we can put text, that's what we're going to try and do to fill that space. Now, again, a lot of times graphic design will keep it very basic, have a photo and text on one side. But the more intricate magazines that are low, beautiful photography in them, sometimes we'll do things like this uh, to, to go through the story, photographic magazines. And so we had to do a safety briefing where the load masters and everybody would talk to us about the flight and what would happen. And of course, sick bags were handed out just in case you threw up. I didn't use mine because thank God I don't get motion sickness, but uh, I don't think anybody did on this one, but other people have on other parts I've done on. Uh, I wanted to get some shots with pilots and crew talking, going through the briefing. And they're doing the call offs. And I thought this was kind of unique because in the Marine Corps, they have a start stocks look to them. So I wanted to capture some of that grit that Marine Corps has. And so we talked about lenses and camera bodies a little bit. And so I talked to the guy before we took off and I asked, I said, what do you guys think? We said, considering what the flight is and how hard they fly, it was better to just take one body. So I said, you know what? I'll just take one body. But what lens do you choose on something like this? So on this instance, I decided to take my Topina 10 to 17 fish off. That's what I decided to stick with. Um, and it is a, it's a very good lens. And so did I make the right decision? I would like to say I think I did, but you know, other times maybe it would have been different. And so at that time, there weren't a lot of great iPhones like we have now, but if we were able to have the iPhones that we have now, it would have been a totally different experience than what I would have done. Same thing with the GoPro cameras. So this is Chris Bautista. He's an avionics guy. He was on the right side with me the whole time in the flight. So I was able to use him as a subject and get some really great shots. Um, right here, I took this photo vertically and him looking out the window, I just thought it was a really good shot that I could use right there. And as a graphic designer, I thought further along, I said, well, what could you do with that photo? So I decided, well, if you black out, add some black on the right side, this could make a nice billboard. This is actually the current Navy thing they have right now. And I thought to myself, well, if you put that on a billboard, something like that, you could run text on a box, you can do a lot of different things from a graphic designer's perspective. So again, a lot of photographers, you guys may not have realized this, but it could be possible that you guys aren't just photographers, but could have an eye for graphic design. So this is it. This is a sequence of the shots of the rocket going off, igniting. And there are a lot more shots of the frames, but I thought this was a pretty good sequence right here of the rocket firing off. And again, all this is scratched uh, from the window, scratched glass, but you can see the uh, so the rockets firing off a great reflection. What was horrible was through all the excitement, I forgot to put my earplugs in. So it was very, very loud. But I figured, you know what? Once in a lifetime, I'm willing to accept the hearing loss. <laughs> uh, this is again with the fish eye, uh, storing vertical. I wanted to capture the curvature of the earth to see what you could get out of it since we go up vertically uh, at a steep angle. And uh, of course, the sun was right there. So got into the horrible sun, but right before we leveled off, I said, you know what, that's okay. So I turned around and of course it's floating above me. <laughs> We're doing negative G at this point at the tip to level off, and everybody goes, wait this. Negative G. Woohoo. <laughs> so this is on the other side. You can see the guy floating up that way, and this guy's having fun. 
Now, unfortunately, the, the photos aren't really sharp. That's because my photo, my camera started floating as well. <laughs> so I had to grab it while she did those shots. So, but you can see the wires floating and everything like that. So, uh, this I thought was a pretty cool angle. You know, you can see the wingtip on how how much you know how steep we're pulling the uh, 360 turn and how steep of an angle we're going. And so, basically, a lot of maneuvers to C130 to do is. Uh, Pretty much war time, or something that's going to go work. So, let's go back to the shot. Horrible photo because of the sun blaring right at you. So, the story had a sad ending because I couldn't use this as a photo I wanted to use because of the, the curvature of the earth and everything, and it just didn't work out. So, had a sad ending. I couldn't use that, but I did get the ride, and it was a once in a lifetime opportunity that nobody will be able to do again. So if you haven't been listening to a lot of this, these things I've been talking about right now, hopefully you guys will wake up and say this. Size does matter, okay? Shoot vertical. And the reason why I'm saying this is because another thing my friend said to me as a photographer for National Geographic, he always said to me, love shooting vertical, love shooting photos horizontally, but I shoot for cover. What does he mean by that? Shoot vertical. Okay. A lot of times the magazines will pay you for an article, but they'll pay you even more for a cover shot. And that's the thing. I did a few articles for uh, Air and Space Magazine, and they wanted to use one of my photos on a special issue for the cover. So they paid me on top of doing the story, which was great. And so here, uh, here's some examples of covers. You always have a header for a lot of the magazines, and then you have the image, and then you have text along everywhere else. Now, one of the things I want to bring up to you is there's a difference between a magazine and newspaper. Okay. Magazines, you know, they have the header, same thing here. This is actually a newspaper that came out every day for a helicopter expo called Holy Expo. They wanted a cover shot of the first helicopter landing at the convention. Well, I gave them the photos and I said, well, there are, there's a lot of debris floating around, the black, you know, everything, really dirty. I said, I can clean that up and say, no, you can't. This is an editorial. This is goes back to photojournalism right here. We want people to feel what it's like to be there. So I couldn't touch that and it killed me because as a photographer, you want really, really clean photos and everything else. But for journalism, again, this goes back to doing newspapers, things like that, whatever you're shooting, Keep that in mind, there are some editors out there that want to be right there in the moment. Okay. And again, you get some more money sometimes. These are a few different uh, views from flying with the aerosol team. Again, shooting vertical sometimes can create a different view and effect. Here we're doing a, a barrel wall, and here we're entering in a loop. Again, shooting, shooting vertical creates a different perspective. And so, Here's another example. And you may be thinking the same thing that I did too. Well, I have a horizontal shot. Could I make this into a cover? Absolutely. The difference is you have a header, you have a, a, something with some text on the bottom. Now, cropping the photo is key right here. Think of this as the final cutout of an eight and a half by 11 cover, right? Now, when you do that, if you're going to do that with a horizontal or landscape photo, keep in mind, before we call a weed, beyond the cut sheet right there, you want to have the color around the entire photograph because when they cut down to eight and a half by 11, you want to make sure when they cut, there's no white edges or anything like that. So that's one of the things that we'll check. The designers and editors will take a look at a photo and go, if you, have, if you don't have a bleed or anything like that, they may exit out because it's not going to be there. So whenever you guys are shooting photos, don't go edge to edge. Always shoot a little bit wider so you can actually crop down to a shot. Um, yesterday, Lorelai was, uh, uh, we we're talking about photos, and that's one of the things that I thought about too when she mentioned cropping. It's good to shoot a little bit wider that way you crop into a shot, and that way it's a little bit of a tighter shot. But you have that play right there to do that. So this is an example of one of the things you can do. So going to get into something about books. 
A lot of photographers love to do books to show the work. Uh, Blurb.com is uh, a company I use. There's plenty of companies like Shutterfly, and there are a whole bunch of other companies that are out there. Blurb, I found, is really good. Um, I'm going to talk about a book that I did, some inserts and stories. I have two examples of books that I did through Blurb. You guys can look through it. The paper quality and also being able to sell your books online really helps you out. Now, yes, you can go to a printer and order 500 books and things like that. What's the problem with that? You're left with a ton of inventory, right? So unless you have a ton of space and you want to shove them all in your house, it's going to take a lot of room. Well, Blurb.com, what they do is it's basically an online bookstore. You can create the book. They have templates for you in InDesign and PDF where you can lay out your book. You can sell the book online on their website and you can set the cost and you can also set the pricing on how much money you want in return. Of course, they take a little percentage because they have to print the books and do the binding and entry and like that. The great thing is you can sell these all over the world. They, anyone all over the world can go. And the shipping cost is they have printers in different countries all over the world. So the shipping cost is very minimal. It's not like an international delivery cost or anything like that. So uh, you go to a bookstore, that's over and over the book that I have. I looked at my name and you can see these two books. Okay, we can talk about that if you have more questions about the book. So, uh, do we have any veterans in here? Anybody serve? Okay, well, thank you to your husband. And my mom. Okay, any, any relatives, any family, veterans that served, I thank them for their service. Um, my father was a veteran, he was in the Air Force. And so, I have a little bit of being a huge part of, you know, being in the world. Dealing with the military, doing photos, and you know, serving and doing things with the Air Force. So, I'm going to take you guys back to Normandy. And uh, during World War II, June 6, 1944, known as D-Day, code name Operation Overlord, more than 160,000 Allied troops landed along 50 mile stretch, heavily fortified French coastline, fighting Nazi Germany on beaches of Normandy, France. White the General White the Eisenhower called the operation a crusade, which we will accept nothing less than full victory. More than 5,000 ships and 13,000 aircraft supported the D-Day invasion. And by day's end, the Allies gained a foothold on the continental Europe. More than 9,000 Allied soldiers were killed or wounded. So 2014, my friend called me and said, I'm going back to Normandy for the Southern You want to go? I said, okay, what are you going to do? We're going to fly some C-47. Drop paratroopers out to get us in trouble. He thought about it and said, you know what? Keep this rule in mind. The party doesn't stop for the fingerprinting stuff. So, of course, I agreed to this. And as you can see, we're very limited on how much we can pack. There's only so much, so much weight we can carry, uh, on, not just on the airline flights, but also. Uh, on the C-47. So we had all the cases. We thought about putting things in there for transport. And uh, the struggle is real because, as you can see, he's trying to cram every little SD card, everything, battery pack, whatever he could shove on the bag without going over. And so we had a little bit of, I the iPhones were very primitive as compared to the day. So iPhones did help and Android phones got us. This is where this is what where we were going with round canopy parachute team. And our journey started in England, Portsmouth, England, and we were going across the English Channel, just like they did on D-Day, and basically crossed over into Normandy. So that we were doing exactly what they did on the on the anniversary of D-Day invasion. Uh, these guys came from all over the world and as you can see, everyone tried to keep the most authentic World War II uniforms. And so we are basically recreating this group. Uh, these guys are made of civilians and uh, active and retired military as well. This is our meeting point, Portsmouth, England. Uh, this is a this is a tip of England where we can cross. And you always want to make sure that you know a little bit about customs of foreign country, of course, being in England, driving on the left side of the road, driving on the right. 
And so we had a guy that was sitting there at the rental car place we were leaving. And we're like, what are you doing on the chair? He's pointing to tell us to be in the left side, not the right side. <laughs> like in America, like, oh, we're the idiots. He's looking up. <laughs> But there was a time we were there, of course, but um, these guys would get a refresher for us on basically how to set up with that line jump out of the C-47 here. Leon Slot is basically right there in Portsmouth. Uh, it's a little town, and this is where a uh, spot was where everybody gathered for one of the ceremonies, for the cost. So the guys walked down the street of the town, and all the paratroopers marched through a gathering, and of course, this is Again, where a lot of people gathered right here. So we had RAF pilots that flew in World War II, infantry guys, dignitaries, military, all right here, their veterans, their families, who all witnessed the ceremony. Uh, these are some of the uh, veterans that were there to tell their stories. And I thought this was a really cool shot from back here. Uh, this is a British Lancaster bomber and two hurricane. The weather was overcast, but just as it flew over, the sun started to peek through the clouds, so I thought it was really neat. I thought it was kind of fitting that these guys were waving at the airplanes going by, looking up. Um, what's really cool is I talked to the local people. What's really neat is the children get a real history lesson about World War II and what took place in Portland. It was a big port for Allied troops to basically get on the ships and cross over. And so a lot of the town people teach this to the younger generation and hear some of the things that they do to keep the history alive. Mm -hmm. Well, believe it or not, this little girl right here is holding a real gas mask from World War II. And I didn't realize they were colorful like that, but I talked to the parents and they said, yeah, that's an authentic gas mask that was passed down from our grandfather. So I thought that was really neat. Uh, this kind of shows you though, the harsh reality of war. And the sacrifice that we made just by looking at that and looking for the history. Had some time. Um, so I thought I'd do some candid fun shots with the people in uniform. This was a wartime era. The ladies were dressed up. So I said, let's get them together looking up at the sky with the T6 as a backdrop. I thought this was a very unique moment. British infantry men talking with some of the RTTP guys about what it was like to be on the front lines of battle. I uh, talked about how they, des they destroyed German tanks. And if you remember Saving Private Ryan, they talked about sticky bombs using the tank rigs to put them attached to uh, the tank class. Well, in their case, sticky bomb referred to a grenade. And so it talked about how they would go in the front lines and just basically demolish the tank using that and how they killed a lot of people. This is a little bit of a funny story right here. And the reason why I have this is because being Americans going into England, I didn't pick up the history because, you know, the customs and things like that. Well, I'm from Texas. I, I enjoy iced tea, whereas I had no idea what English tea was. So when I went to go look for lemons to make iced tea, the woman's like, what are you looking for? I said, I'm looking for lemons. And she's like, for what? To make tea. And she goes, oh, no. <laughs> That's not how you make tea. <laughs> So she showed me how to make English tea with milk and all the other things. So by the end of the day, the whole entire airport knew who I was. I was the American who didn't know what English tea was. <laughs> so that's the funny story behind this photo. So the C-47 Dakotas were the airplanes that the paratroopers shot out of uh, during the war that brought World War II in the I want to talk a little about the veteran. Um, just real quick yes, on that slide. So was that a full the other one before? Was that a full shot? And then you did that yes. that white out for the graphic part. Yes. Very cool. Yeah, I'm sorry. These are all eight of the C 47s that were crossing with us uh, across the English Channel. Uh actually one of the the photos I'll get to in a second here, I'll tell you. Uh okay, so this is one of the war World War II veterans. This is this airplane thing driving me. This was actually one of the airplanes that flew on D Day. And so, again, seven years later, this airplane is flying across the English Channel to drop paratroopers over Normandy. And you can see on the inside, these are the operations on D Day, Elmira, and then all the way right there. That is actually a photo 
of the airplane getting ready to tow a glider. This is Union Jack Dak. The airplane they called, they changed the name of Plaza Lassie after this. Uh, but this was actually in Florida. They flew this airplane from Florida all the way up over Iceland, all the way into France, just for this. So that was pretty rare that this airplane flew all the way from Florida, all the way up and over in France. Um, this airplane was assigned to the 74th Troop Carrier Squadron and actually towed the glider's equipment for 101st Air Force. So we get to crossing the English Channel and getting ready. Okay. The weather, of course, we're an 80 year old airplane, so we have to make sure everything runs smoothly and getting across. So, just like on D Day, actually, the weather conditions, there were clouds and light rain, so we're kind of in a hole anticipating what we're going to do, but we're going to be able to fly across or not. So, while that was going on, the pilots were discussing the flying, and all the rest of us, we all had to wear life vests because from Portsmouth to Sherbert, it's 95 miles of water. So it's a lot of water to swim, and I don't think any of us could have done it. But we got a break in the weather. And so once they said the weather was, you know, we're clear to go, we all scrambled into the airplanes just like we did there more time. So we took off. As you can see, the, the, the load master was looking out, making sure we're going out. You can just hear the loud engines, and you can just hear the radio engines, see the smoke, everything. And we start taking off. And this is a seating arrangement, how the guys look, uh, sitting down with the life vests on. And as we're taking off, you can see Ken and some of the other guys look around and all of us were just kind of thinking what it was like to take off on D-Day. So this is what the formation looked like. We're crossing across the water here with all eight of us. And you know, you get a sense of what it was really like. So we finally got across to France. By the time we got to the shoreline, we got some unfortunate news that we couldn't jump because the winds were too hot. So we had to land and go into the airport. Now, the problem is once we got to the airport, we realized that they closed the airport to the public. Only the dignitaries and President Obama and other people were allowed to go in, but nobody else were able to attend the events like we had hoped. So unfortunately, all the people got stuck behind the fence line to watch us land and couldn't come over. To, to enjoy and tour the airplanes. Uh, I thought this was a neat photo because you know you can see everybody getting off of the airplane. So it's kind of like if you've seen the historical photos where a ton of people are walking to the airplanes, it's kind of reverse, but just to give you a uh, situation of what it looks like. So the paratroopers, round canopy parachute team, uh, they basically had seven drop zones throughout the week of the DDA anniversary. Um, some of the guys were active U.S. Army in the in 82nd and 101st Airborne. So Lafayette was really, really uh, significant during the war. And this is Iron Mike right here. This is a tribute to the Airborne soldiers. And so it's an honor of the Army Infantry School at Fort Benning. So one of the reasons Lafayette was interesting is because there were bridges. Uh, that were exits off to Utah Beach. And so the Germans controlled them. But before the parachute was dropped the night before, the Germans flooded the whole area. So none of the troops knew that it was all water. So a lot of troops drowned in that. But during that event, there were a thousand paratroopers that went out that day. And so you can see the people lined up. You can see the waterways and channels when it wasn't flooded, how they looked. And again, this is Normandy. This is like a countryside. So there's a lot of two lane roads, not major highways or anything like that, like we have here. Uh, but you can see this is how the jumpers went out of the C 130s. It's current jumping uh, for the paratroopers. And then this is how they did it out of the World War II, uh, the C 47s. Similar tradition continues. And it's a little different view right here. And again, you're you're jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. So. Mm -hmm. um, here you can see the jumpers going out of the C-130s right here, and you can tell the round canopy guys versus the more modern 
shoots a little more square. And so that's what they look like today. Again, you can see the waterways, the little channels all over the field. And some people did end up in the water. So luckily they had the floaties and the guys to rescue them. Every country that participated in World War II, Germans, even allied in the Germans, like Norway, every uh, country had a jumper with their flag. And so it's really neat to see everybody come together to do this. Some people, they get tangled up with the risk of being a paratrooper. Um, luckily, these guys got untangled right before they landed, so nobody got hurt. And so it's uh, it's one of the risks you take of a paratrooper and a jumper in the airborne. Pokerville, there was a more secluded jump. Uh, there's a lot of fields, a lot of tall grass, makes you sneeze. Um, this was right outside the villages of where thousands of POWs, uh, Nazi POWs, uh, were detained at an allied prison camp. So you can see the tall grass. Every The tall grass was uh, ridiculous. Made their mice sneeze. And so my friend and I were sitting next, uh, staying at a French woman's house named Therese. Therese looked at me and she says, I know how to fix that. Calvados. I didn't know Calvados was a brandy that was made just in Normandy. So I drank the first glass, turned into three glasses, and four glasses. Well, mm -hmm. not a big deal. My, my sinuses cleared up, went away. But I fell asleep in bed with our golden retriever. <laughs> and I thought it was my bed, but I was in his bed. That's why the look right there is green, because the rest of the <laughs> Don't come in my bed anymore. So I thought that was pretty funny. But here's a different view from that job. It's really neat to see how the C-47s and paratroopers go out. So at the end of the jump, trying to get photos of the guys with the American flag is that's pretty iconic to get that shot. And of course, who doesn't love getting kissed by a beautiful woman after a jump with the GI? <laughs> a lot of towns all across Normandy all have ceremonies. Uh, and you'll see markers all over the towns when they were liberated and what was important about the village. And so here was a ceremony in Highsville right here. There was a medical station here. And they tell you what, what day uh, the town was liberated. So here we had a couple of World War II veterans and they're very fortunate if you have World War II veterans show up there. They're treated like gods and they're treated like rock stars as they should be. People gather around them, want to hear the stories, give them the utmost respect. And afterwards, that was ceremony. Same thing laying a wreath here. So believe it or not, most of these guys are all French. They like to dress up, not, a, not to imitate Americans, but to show great respect. From the boots all the way to their hats, they want to keep their uniforms as authentic as possible to show respect of what the Americans did liberating France. So this is a place, Angleville. What's historic about this place is this church. This is a church that was built 700 years ago and truly became a sanctuary. One of the reasons that is is because of this. The pews right here have remained from World War II, untouched. This was actually a neutral zone for Americans and Germans to be treated. Right more were two uh, soldiers from Airborne that landed in, into the town. And the medics refused to allow the weapons inside the church. So some of the German soldiers refused to do that and they were turned away, but others honored the request. So the pews are a constant reminder when you walk in there, you'll see the blood stains and everything else on there. And that's like a constant reminder to these people of what happened here. So after D-Day, two days later, German soldiers emerged that were hiding in the bell tower. And so this is a state glass window dedicated to that time. Outside again, another ceremony with uh, the French military and dignitaries. And right here, C-130 flew over at ceremonies all across the Normandy. There are veterans right here that were forced up to attend. 
these two ladies here were very important and I didn't realize that until after the fact. What's great was that there aren't a lot of police there, but they had guys dressed up as military directing people, directing traffic wherever to go. So it takes you back in time right there. You know, there'd be cars and Jeeps, but also you'd have a tank every once in a while just drive around. So that's actually a Sherman tank driving through the towns. I thought it was neat right here. Where else can you find a Chevy Bronco <laughs> in a Wyler Jeep driving through the French countryside? Right here, it was pretty funny to me. Um, we had the traffic, so just showing the Jeep uh, with the lady just hanging out. I thought it was a nice photo. And um, it's a dream if you love military view. And this is on Utah Beach, so I was able to get a really nice shot of the, the vehicles. So the vehicles are very important. And I learned this because it's like a legacy. A lot of these vehicles were left behind after World War II, and a lot of families were able to collect them, fix them, and use them. And they're actually a family member. I talked to some people, and they have air, they have temperature-controlled garages rather than having them in their house because that's how valuable a Jeep is. <laughs> so one of the reasons I took this photo is because this is Raymond Bouquet. He was a, he was a mayor of St. Laurent. And a couple of years after this, after the anniversary, I went back over and over again with Ladies to Liberty. They're like the Andrew sisters were seeing, just like the Andrew sisters performing. They introduced me to him, and he explained it to me this, this chief right here and all the rest of them that families have is important because on D Day, him and his father were rescued by the Americans and they were taken up the river where they were liberated. So he remembers riding in the Jeep just like that one during World War II on D Day. And so that is one of the reminders right there why to these people it is so important. He let us stay in a house, a beach house that he had on the water behind them right there, and just stayed the entire time. This is you only record. This is for you guys. So we're getting to some veterans here. This was a story heard all around the world. The morning of June 5th, uh, my friend told me about a national news story about this 93-year-old veteran, Jim Pee Wee Martin. He's going to do, do another parachute drop 70 years later again for the day anniversary. He was with the 101st Airborne 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, PIR, parachuted in Utah Beach hours before the day landings, went to Normandy to fight in Holland, where he was wounded from Holland to the Battle of Bolt in Belgium, from Belgium to Adolf Hitler's retreat in the Bavarian Alps. It would have been incredible to meet this guy. And so later on, we actually met him. We were at the drop zone where he was going. He was going to land. So off in the distance, you could hear the C-47s coming over. And they dropped the paratroopers and came back around again at a higher altitude and dropped in uh, at a cannon jump. So they landed, everybody's cheering, everybody's going nuts for him. And then someone gave him a cell phone where he had to talk to the wife. He told his wife, I'm doing okay. I'm just fine. Everything's great. After he got done with that, he raised his hand and everybody got quiet like this part of the Red Sea. He said, I just want to thank you to all the French people who came out. I expected maybe 50 people here. And of course, when I landed before, Germans were all trying to kill me, but now people all want to take pictures and kiss me on the cheek. <laughs> so reporters and photographers swarmed this veteran. It was a complete media frenzy. Cameras were clicking everywhere. People were asking questions and everything else. And then they also said something here. At the time of D-Day, we were almost in a position of losing the war. That's why I joined, and today, I applaud anyone who is willing to serve in the military. Hang in there, keep motivated, and keep your passion up. You may think it's a terrible day. Some of us did at the time. But now, looking back 70 years later, it was the best time of our whole lives. And throughout the reporter's questions, one of them asked, how was the drop? His response was, 
They shrugged the shoulders. It was much more enjoyable. No one shot at me. <laughs> So I asked him, I said, what do you like? Did you like the skydive like this? Or did you like to static blind jump out of the C-47? He says, you know what? I looked down as we're free falling and the whole landscape was changed. You know, I didn't have to wear any gear, so it was great. But I did want to jump out by myself and they wouldn't let me. <laughs> this is another reason why they are the greatest generation I've ever been. to have such a great group like this. <laughs> This was another great moment because he didn't realize that everybody was saluting him. So I thought it was really neat that when he posted his picture, everybody was saluting him. So this is another veteran here of the two ladies that I took a picture of earlier. I had no idea who these people were. This is Ella Hobinsky and her sister, Dorothy, uh, as well. So Ella's on the left and Dorothy's on the right. These two ladies, I didn't realize who they were until recently, a few years later. But I took this photo at that ceremony of them looking up at the airplanes when they're flying over. So I thought that was a really cool photo. But in 2019, where I was at a private party where she ended up being there at this nice chateau. Uh, and I walked up to her, you know, I was introduced to the and I walked up to her and said, I have no idea who you were at the time. And I got the story from somebody else saying that she was a nurse. So I said, I have to meet this woman. So she said, well, I'm nobody special thinking my head, but to the rest of the world, she is. Those two those medals right there that you see is a French national order of the Legion of Honor medals. It's like receiving the Medal of Honor in the US. Uh, older sister was Dorothy. Unfortunately, she passed away in 2015. So what's funny is that she's in this, she says, well, the doctors told me I couldn't come, but I'm 99 years old. And she says, well, since I'm 99 years old, I don't give a damn what doctors say. <laughs> I'm coming anyways. <laughs> so she, she talked to me about the Great Depression and growing up in New Jersey and how she became a nurse. And then her sister, Dorothy, was also a nurse. But Ellen wanted to join the army and, and go and help the soldiers out. Dorothy hated the fact that she joined the army and didn't want to be alone, didn't want her to be alone. So Dorothy joined as well. So they served together in France. And after I met with her, there was unveiling a memorial in their honor. So even though Dorothy and Ellen were not present on V-Day, but arrived months later, memories of serving with the 164th General Field Hospital Bowville remained with her forever. She talked about being cold, no matter what, with blankets and fire that kept going out, was horrible conditions for the soldiers. The wounded soldiers kept screaming. She didn't know what to do. And you, she heard shooting off in the distance a lot. And to her, she never knew whether or not Germans were just going to come in and kill them all in the tent or not. But she didn't like the fact that her sister joined just because of her. And if something happened to her, she would have felt really horrible. And sadly, after I saw her, she passed away November 20th, 2019. So I'm going to take you guys on what it was like to fly and drop jumpers on June 6th. I didn't plan on flying. I thought we were going to fly on the <laughs> mission any, any other day of that week. But they allowed me to fly actually on June 6th, 70th anniversary of the day. So the morning we we're at Sherbrooke Airport, all of us got together with logistics and we talked about what was going on. And the drop zone was going to be St. Marie du Mont. So the time came, wanted to get some shots of the soldiers going out with their shadows down below, going to the C 47s. And again, I tried to mimic some of the photographs that I saw, minus, of course, the GoPros and the iPhone. 
But I thought it was really neat to capture some of these moments of these guys just laying on their backs on their shoots and getting ready to go. So with my fish eye again, I thought it was a neat view right here. This is kind of a symbol for hookup on the static line. So I got them to do that. So I thought that was a neat shot. So we finally took off. Uh, this is Ben, our jump master here. And basically he drops some streamers and makes sure he's, he makes sure everybody gets out of the airplane safely. He is actually currently serving in the US Army as a parachute rigger. And he's also jumped into many combat zones as a US Army person. Uh, so for him to do this was pretty amazing because he said it was like stepping back in time. And he goes, now I realize what people did before me. So in other words, for him, he just said it was badass. So we got together flying in formation right here. You can see the coastline. So to have two D-Day veterans C-47s to fly on and jump out of was pretty unique and incredible. I actually turned my camera to shoot some of the guys' faces and you could see some of the reactions right there. And just the simple fact that we we're doing this recreated history was pretty emotional. Some of the guys had grandparents that actually went to and died on, you know, after days after D Day, and sometimes uh, other members of the family, you know, survived and had a good life. So, time came, getting ready to jump. Everybody had to stand up, hook up, get in line. Everybody was given the shouting. Jump master had to check everybody, make sure all equipment checks were done. Each person checked each other, one behind the other. Getting ready to jump door, you see the red light right there. When the green light kicks on, jump. And there we go. Out the jumpers went. You got a pound on the butt, go out the door. You don't want to stop the stick at all at any cost. But if there was something unsafe, you didn't get the pat on the butt, you jumped off to the side and let somebody else go. After the jump, Guys would bring in the static lines after they all went out and then set up for the next stick to go out. After that, a few seconds, it was done. Mission was accomplished. Everybody got out. After the drop, we flew over some of the towns of a flyover. This is actually St. Mary Gleese where a lot of the events took place. Uh, if you go to St. Mary Gleese, there's a church and there's actually a paratrooper hanging off to the side. And that's actually uh, resembles actual paratroopers that got caught on the side of the buildings. So that stays there as a reminder. After flying over, I was able to get a photo of the C-47 and get some of the landscape there. And again, this is closer to sunset. So really vibrant right here with the fields. You can see the hedgerows everywhere and you can just get a sense of the landscape. So it was a once in a lifetime opportunity that I'll never forget. Um, so during this trip, and one more place. This is the Normandy American Cemetery. It's located in Colville. Cemetery site covers 172.5 acres and contains the graves of 9,386 of our military dead. Most of them lost their lives on D-Day landings and ensuing operations. On the walls of the missing, in the semicircular garden on the east side of the memorial are inscribed 1,557 names. Rosettes mark the names of those since recovered and identified. The memorial consists of a semicircular colonnade, Melodia, at each end containing large maps and narratives of the military operations. At the center is a bronze statue with a quote saying, Spirit of American Youth Rising from the Waves. When you first walk up from the parking lot, you're at the visitor center, you have to check in and you're at, you don't see anything. But there's a lot of trees to the left side and you can see off into the ocean because we're high up on the flood. So after checking in, you walk over and you can walk through the trees. Uh, my friend said to me, he goes, when we get there, I'll give you a moment. And I looked at him, I said, well, I think I'll be okay. And his face grew somber and looked at me and says, that's what I thought too. So after walking a little bit further, 
you'll see rows of crosses as far as the eye can see to a tree line, and there's another section down there. So the crosses, you'll see the names of soldiers that died, where they were from. Uh, each dead stone had their name, rank, unit, and state they were from and the day they died. Looking at the date, you can clearly tell if you died on the week of the day invasion and actually on the day. When you walk up and down the road, some of the headstones don't have a name, but a place for an unknown soldier with the quote. Here rests an honored boy, a comrade in arms, known but to God. And a lot of people were buried there that had that. And I thought it was very sad because I'm pretty sure a lot of families never got the closure they needed with the, the family members that passed away. So I had a lot of time to sit there and reflect on what it was like to see this adventure, what I'd been through. The veterans talking to them, listening to their stories. And what was really fascinating is, and actually hard to swallow is, you see the terror that went, the veterans went through on D-Day. They lost a lot of people, they lost their friends, and they were scared. You know, there's a lot of things that people shouldn't have seen. And it kind of remains with the military today. A lot of military fight, and they don't tell their families because they don't want their families to see the horror that they saw within this country. <laughs> this is a photo of the cemetery. I want to leave this photo with you guys to look and see what it's like uh, to be there. Um, this is one last photo that I took before I left, but I did have a photo of my friend's uncle and he was a B-24 waste gunner. Uh, she had told me he died in a mission. His whole crew, a B-24 got shot down and he was the only survivor. So he had a good life. And, you know, the year before I did this, he had passed away and she said, she gave me the photo and said, when you go to the cemetery, can you leave his photo next to a tombstone so he could be with his crew. So that's what I did. I found a B-24 squadron and a, a navigator, and then I sat the photo next to it. So I'm going to close you guys with one last video. And I wanted to explain the story and share the story with everyone. So I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation and we can do a QA and a afterwards. So this is a video. Thank you so much.